Hi all, Aaron here with a quick video on photographing artwork. When you think about photographing artwork, you have to realize that especially now um, with so many things that are done digitally, the photographs that are shared about an artwork are often the only information someone viewing those images has about the work itself. So it's really important to have a good photograph or good photographs to represent the artworks that you're trying to show to others. We're gonna talk fairly quickly about some of the common pitfalls um, that we see when we uh, look at digital photographs um, submitted for things like the Scholastic Art Awards uh, or the Artist, Artist Teacher Exhibition um, that I hope you and your students can use to uh, take better photographs to represent the artworks that they're putting out there. This is a copy stand. Uh, this is a type of equipment that you, you may have in your school and you may not. Um, I have actually found that I have just as much trouble with copy stands um, as I might uh, trying to take a photograph without a copy stand. Uh, they are a piece of equipment that can be useful if it's set up really well, has good lighting, um, etc. But many of the pitfalls that we're going to talk about here today um, can, can be pitfalls even if you're using a copy stand. This, this piece of equipment designed to hold the camera for you and to light the artwork for you. In fact, what I tend to recommend is kind of a body copy stand. What I usually do to photograph artworks and the way I teach my students is to simply put the artwork on a nice flat surface like on a table and hold the camera as still as you can directly above that artwork to take the picture. If it's a larger artwork you can do the same thing by putting the artwork on the floor and holding the camera higher um, by standing uh, above the artwork to take the picture. Um, but even when you do that very simple approach, um, there can be a number of challenges that you really have to think about to get a good quality picture. Before we go on, let's talk quickly about cameras. You may have uh, different cameras available to you to take the images uh, of, of the artworks that you're looking at. Um, here we're looking at a cell phone. Um, uh, um, what I tend to refer to as a compact digital camera, like the Canon PowerShot uh, shown, and a digital SLR, uh, a fancier high-end uh, digital camera. These three cameras um, may have uh, different image sizes uh, that are going to come out, but you actually find that, that just because one camera seems fancier doesn't always mean it's going to come out with a much better picture. Um, I did some experiments with a uh, iPhone 6 with a Canon PowerShot that was uh, two or three years old and with a Nikon D70 which was well several years old seven or eight years old and the the um, technology in those varies uh, such that um, the a slightly older camera uh, you may find really doesn't have a larger or better quality picture than you can get even with a cell phone. So I recommend uh, in general using what camera you have available to you uh, to, to take pictures because you're going to find that even most cell phones these days take pretty good digital images. So what are some of the common problems that we're going to look at? Uh, we're going to talk quickly about focus. We'll talk about framing and cropping, background distractions, uh, keystoning, or what's also sometimes known as parallax. We'll talk about lighting and white balance and glare. Uh, and then we'll also take a little bit of time uh, at the end to look at uh, the, the ways that we think about photographing three-dimensional artwork, which can be a little bit different from looking at two-dimensional work. So let's talk very quickly about focus. Um, this is obvious and I don't wanna dwell on it. Uh, a picture that's slightly out of focus can really uh, throw a juror or a judge who's looking at the artwork. So just make sure they're, they're in focus. Make sure you take a look at the images that you've taken, preferably on a larger screen, not just on the uh, viewfinder on your camera or the small screen on your phone, uh, to make sure that that image is in focus as best as it can be. Uh, and, and, you know, it, with digital imaging, we can take many pictures and then choose the best ones. So take advantage of that uh, and make sure that you have a good quality image in focus. 
Framing and cropping um, is kind of the next uh, simplest thing to be thinking about. When you take a picture of a two-dimensional artwork, you're usually dealing with a rectangle and you're dealing with a camera that takes a picture of a rectangle. So line those up in such a way that you're gonna get as much of the picture as you can, filling the camera without cropping out part of the artwork. You can see the two images on the right-hand side have way too much extra space showing, and you really wanna fill the view finder of the camera with the artwork as best you can. Uh, the one at the top on the right, uh, if it were rotated uh, or the camera rotated, would fill that uh, viewfinder better and you'd get more of the picture showing the artwork and you wouldn't have all that empty space. Um, similar uh, issue with the bottom, you just need to zoom in or perhaps put that artwork up on the table so that you can get it better. The image on the lower left actually has parts of the artwork cropped out and that's no good either. You need to show the entire work. Far better to have a small edge of, of blank background showing all the way around the work so that the judge can, can see all the way to the edges of the artwork um, than to crop any part of the artwork out. And obviously the, um, the image on the upper left uh, is just crooked. And, and that's something that can be very distracting to a judge as well. And you wanna minimize any distractions that you can while taking to, when taking a, a good quality image. When you're thinking about what is in the background, uh, you really want to minimize distractions. The the piece uh, on the upper left there, if you can see, has fingers showing in the in the corner of the image, and that's no good. We want to get those little distractions out of there. Uh, the image on the upper right, uh, you can see feet uh, and. Uh, so we wouldn't want to see anything like that, but the idea that's shown there is that the artwork is laying on a large piece of black paper, and that's the right idea. You want to use something that's going to create a blank background. You don't want to have a busy background like the tile floor shown in the lower left, um, and you don't want to have other distractions um, in there like the, the push pins that you can see in the image in the lower right. Next, we want to talk quickly about keystoning, or what is all sometimes known as parallax. Uh, this is the idea, um, like, like linear perspective, that when you are looking at something that recedes into the distance, the, the uh, things closer to you look larger and the things further away from you look smaller. So if you lay an, uh, a flat artwork on a table and then you hold the camera pointing at that artwork at an angle, that edge that's closest to you, like in the image we're looking at, is going to look bigger than the edge that's further away from you. So you really want to be very careful to hold the camera in such a way that it is directly above the artwork if it's on a flat surface uh, so that you don't get that parallax so that it doesn't create that keystone shape. Uh, adjusting the camera position uh, until you can can see through the viewfinder that there's really minimized keystoning uh, in the image that you're going to capture is the best way to take care of that. So you do want to make sure that the camera is directly above the artwork when you can have it laid flat. Now sometimes you're dealing with an artwork that you can't just lay on a table or lay on the floor and photograph. Perhaps it's a really large piece uh, that is on an easel or that you could just lean up against a wall. You still need to position the camera so that it is really, um, you know, directing its view perpendicular to that artwork and you're really going to get an image that, that doesn't have the keystoning that you can see uh, in this example. Next, we'll talk about lighting and white balance. Now, we are uh, very lucky in these modern times. Most of the cameras that we're using these days, uh, including our phones, uh, are, are probably uh, using some kind of an automated white balance system, which is what that means is that the camera is trying to find the lightest, whitest part of any image that uh, is captured, and it's balancing the light and the color tone of that image based on the, um, the identification of that place that should be white. Um, so if you look at these images, the coloration on the images is all a little bit different. Uh, in the upper left, 
It's very kind of yellow orange, um, especially down in the lower right. The one that that image looks kind of on the bluish tone. Um, and the, the one on the lower left is really the closest representation of what this artwork should look like um, in terms of color. You can see that the whites seem white um, and the colors don't seem like they're washed out with some other kind of a color tone. So our cameras can correct that, but they won't always. So if you're taking a picture in a room that has primarily incandescent lights, you might get that uh, orange or yellow cast. Uh, some uh, some fluorescent lighting will have a blue cast. So you really want to use natural light whenever you can. Here's some examples um, of, of these image, this artwork uh, photographed in natural light. The one in the upper left was actually taken very close to a window um, during a, a a bright day so there was a good amount of light coming in through the window and it's a, that's a pretty good solid picture the one in the upper right was actually taken outside on that same day in direct sunlight shining on the artwork and in this case that worked out pretty well that won't always work out well one of the things you definitely have to be concerned about if you're using direct sunlight is making sure that there's no cast shadow like the image uh, shown on the bottom here Here's another example of white balance. I found this example really interesting because this was an actual submission to the Scholastic Art Awards a number of years back. Uh, here we have three different images of the same clay piece. Uh, one of the images on the left has actually been turned to grayscale, um, but the other two images really uh, exaggerate um, the, the kind of color balance that you can get from different photographs depending on the lighting or the way that, that the, uh, the photograph is, uh, the, or the camera is, is capturing the light in the room. So one of these looking very orange and the other looking very pink. You definitely want to avoid presenting multiple images images that show it in different light casting. You just want to show it with the best natural light um, that you're able to get. Glare is another consideration when you're photographing and thinking about lighting. Uh, the image on the left here is behind a piece of glass. So if you have an artwork that's been framed, for example, uh, you really want to be careful about photographing it through the glass um, or, uh, or any other really shiny surface um, that might be in front of it, an acetate surface um, that's been placed over the artwork, for example. The glare and reflection um, in that glass is very distracting and, it, and you can't see the artwork very well. Uh, the image on the right uh, does not have glass over it, but what you can what you can see if you look uh, to that little house right in the center of the picture is that it seems to have a blowout of some kind. There's it's all white right there in that spot, um, even to the point where you can't even see uh, the little door that had been painted on that house. That blowout is just from using a flash when photographing this artwork. So really think carefully about the lighting that you're using, and if you can turn the flash off on your camera so that you don't create a glare right in the middle um, of an artwork that you're photographing that is best. We'll talk quickly about photographing 3D artwork here. Um, a, a really good standard whether you're applying a uh, to, or submitting artwork to Scholastic or to a, another um, place, a really good standard for photographing three-dimensional work is that um, is the one that's used by the Scholastic Art Award. So in that case, artists can submit up to four JPEG images that represent the work, and um, you definitely you always want to have a primary. Uh, image. So the first image that's presented um, should always be your primary image and you should think about that one like if I only had one picture to show what this artwork is all about what would that picture be um, and and so you really want to get that best picture um, to put the put the artwork and, and feature the artwork without other distractions um, in in the first image that you present. One of the images should include a ruler or other object as the second image shown here. And then the other images should show different angles or details um, so, that, uh, so that the images uh, in whole by looking at those four images give you a really good impression of what's presented to the artwork. 
Just like two-dimensional work, you need to think about the background and you need to make sure that the work is lit well. Um, if you can imagine a full-size chair um, and think about how large this black backdrop must have been, um, you can realize that when you get to a larger sculpture, you, you might need to have um, you know a significant space and a large black cloth or, or the like uh, to create a nice simple background that's not going to distract us from the image. Also make sure that there's not a ruler in every one of your images like this submission actually was a number of years ago. Uh, you need to have a ruler in it uh, or, or some other objects to give us um, an idea of scale in one image, but you don't need to have it in any more than one image. And in this case, uh, we had a submission where we didn't really have uh, you know, a primary best image of the artwork because every image had a ruler that was in the way and was distracting us from seeing the artwork all by itself. Thinking about lighting for three-dimensional work is kind of interesting. Uh, this particular example has one indirect sun and another one in indirect light where the where the sunshine's not shining directly on it um, and and you can see that both of them work pretty well um, so the direct sunlight can work in your favor as long as it doesn't create too much of a glare on the surface or too dark a shadow um, on the shadowed side of a three-dimensional piece that light um, and shadow that shows the roundness and three-dimensionality of the object can benefit you so you just have to try the those out um, and, and get the best image that you can. Here's the same object photographed uh, six different times. So if you were to look at these, uh, think about which four you would choose uh, to, to represent this, this image according to the standards that we've been talking about. Um, which one of these would be your primary image? Which would you want it to, sh to show as, as that one image that you would use if you could use no others? And then what other three images would you use to really show um, what you wanted to show about the artwork? Extending a little bit past three-dimensional art, we have some work that is time-based or that you could consider four-dimensional art. Time-based artworks can be shown with sequential images, so then you have to think about them a little bit differently from a, 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 you know, a, a static three-dimensional work. In this case, this artwork is shown kind of changing over time with the lights on and then that steam rising uh, in the third image. A uh, clever approach to, um, to really being able to show everything that this artist wanted to show uh, was actually uh, piecing photographs together in Photoshop, for example, and then saving a pair of photographs as a separate JPEG. So what you're seeing here is actually four JPEGs, but we're looking at eight photographs because the artist took two photographs and put them together and then saved that as a single JPEG, which was rather clever to be able to show all of um, what was happening with this artwork, um, which was a time-based piece as well, where clay uh, figures were placed in a tree and they were uh, uh, degrading over time and, and exposure to the elements. Finally, I want you to take a look at this artwork. The reality is that some artworks are rather difficult to show in still images to really get an understanding and appreciation for what you're looking at. This artwork was presented with these four images in the order as they're numbered on the screen here. So think about this for a second. Try and figure out what it is that you're looking at. And think for yourself, what might you have done differently? Would you have taken a picture different um, from what we're seeing here? And would you have presented them in a different order? Think about those things as you're photographing your artworks. Try to avoid some of the pitfalls that we've looked at, and I'm sure that you'll get great results. Best of luck.